All right. So today I'm here with Agu Sudianto, uh, Executive Vice President and Head of Corporate Model Risk at Wells Fargo, as well as my friend Patrick Hall, co-founder of BNH.AI, the first law firm focused on AI and analytics. And full disclosure, I'm an advisor to BNH. So welcome both to the Data Exchange podcast. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Happy to be here. All right. So we're here to talk about, uh, e hopefully, either the book is already out or about to come out on the new O'Reilly book on uh, machine learning risk management. Um, and I know, Patrick, as part of the law firm, you talk to a lot of companies and a goose as part of your uh, job as a co corporate model risk leader at Wells Fargo. This is a topic you folks have thought a lot about. So, but first question, high level, um, aren't there enough resources out there? So why do we need a book? So what was the motivation for writing a book? Sure, and and I'd love to hear what Agus thinks about this. Um, there are really good resources for model risk management. And in particular, in my opinion, you know, and I know, I know this is boring, but they come from banking regulators. So um, the initial paper was called SR 117 back in uh, back in 2011. Um, there was sort of an extended version, an examiner's handbook that came out in 2011. Um, and then, of course, NIST just did their AI risk management framework. And I think the book is meant to bridge the gap, right? SR 117 doesn't tell you what to code. Um, NIST doesn't tell you what to code. The book provides sort of practitioner level commentary around these authoritative resources and code examples. So, so I hope that's the utility of the book. But uh, Agus has seen the book, and and you know he has his own opinions on on how to get these ideas out there. So, so happy to hear what he thinks about this. Yeah, I think this is a uh, a subject that financial particularly for banks, has been doing for the last more than 10 years. And that it was since the uh, SR 11 since the, uh, the, the past crisis, basically. So the big bank has a very, very mature process in uh, model risk management. And then when AI and ML becoming the adoption accelerate, now, the, uh, the industry uh, uh, adopting the framework of MRM to manage uh, AI and machine learning risks with some tweak. Now, one thing is about the uh, regulation, the guidance, and all of those things. Another thing is on the practice side. How do we do it day in and day out? So all of these things, day in and day out, are something that big banks in particular have been honing, doing, refining it. But no such thing as a textbook that really explain how in practice to do it. So when I look at what Patrick is writing, I think it's like, okay, right on the spot, you need to, uh, to really bridge the gap between that. And in, in particular, for industry outside banking, yes, yes. because that is something that may be foreign for industry outside banking, where banking has been doing this. Uh, and, and I myself, and Patrick knows, Patrick work, uh, we work in collaborating. I, uh, we, we, we release a, uh, we have a package out there uh, called PyML, Python Interpretable Machine Learning, which kind of coding that people can use. But having a book like what Patrick wrote as a framework that people can use and learn and, 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 and practice how to do it. I think that's what this book is all about. To, uh, so, and, and before we go more into the book, just to inject some sense of urgency, Patrick, uh, just give us very briefly, uh, what's the situation right now in terms of regulations? I know the EU AI Act yeah, is about yeah. to come online later this year, but uh, uh, there's more and more of these, right? Yes. So, so you know, in a goose's world, he's been dealing with, with fairly serious regulation and guidance for you know over 10 years now but for the rest of the world um i think the eu ai act is going to hit like a ton of bricks um you know it it 
prescribes fairly serious documentation and uh, technical compliance requirements for all kinds of machine learning systems and specifically bans some machine learning systems. Um, we see things happening at the state level and even the city level. So um, it, originally it, it was scheduled for the beginning of the year. It was pushed to April 15th. You know, there's a law in New York City now that mandates bias testing of AI systems used in employment. The FDA um, just uh, promulgated or, or issued their software as a medical device guidance. So um, machine learning is changing quickly from an unregulated space to a space where the regulations are new and complicated. And, and that's definitely one reason why we wrote the book. Now, of course, the book isn't legal advice. If people want legal yeah. advice, they have to call B&H. But um, it is written to help people generally comply with, with you know, broad sets of regulation. And then the other thing, of course, that uh, uh, is happening is at the moment where uh, more and more of these regulations are starting to come online, the utility and capability of these systems is expanding. So is exploding. So, yeah. so now are, are we talking about also having to be concerned about Section 230, right? So given that uh, these models are generating content and so on and so forth. All right. So now... Uh, the book covers a lot of very practical things. So the first thing I'll talk about is interpretable and explainable machine learning. Um, by the way, Patrick, uh, do you make a distinction between these two terms, interpretable and explainable? I do, I do. And let's get let's get Agus's opinion on this. But um, practically, all right, so in a practical sense, in one way, it doesn't matter. You know, you call it explainable, I call it interpretable, vice versa. You know, we want the models to be transparent. That's the bottom line. But, you know, if and if you two esteemed gentlemen agree with me, you know, I think we do have a vocabulary problem in machine learning, right? We can't agree on what a row going across the data set is we call it and what we call a row going down the data set. You know, we can't agree on some very basic stuff. And so NIST, and, and I see that leading to problems, you know, in teaching and communication and documentation. Um, and so when NIST goes to the trouble to define these terms, I try to stick with it. And so NIST has put out definitions for explainability and interpretability that I like. They're based on theories from psychology. And, and essentially, explanation is low level, answers questions about how, technical. Inter interpretability or interpretation is higher level, contextualizes, human informa contextualizes technical information and human experience. And so I like those definitions, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not the thought police. So I'm interested to hear what Agus has to say. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Agus, uh, in finance, do you make a distinction? Well, I, I, I'm not so much into the distinction of uh, interpretability or explainability. What I care a lot is, I always say this, all models are wrong. And when they are wrong, they, they hard, they create harm either to the company, the user, or the customer who are subjected to the model. Now, the, 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 the funda fundamental part is, is the model conceptually sound? Is the model make sense? And to, to make sure that the model makes sense, we need to understand the model. And that's the really the foundation of interpretability and explainability make sure that the model makes sense because the problem with today's in uh, machine learning culture is people simply looking at the model performance. Well, we have big problem in machine learning because we can have multiple models, many models, performance almost the same, yet they are very different models and some of them doesn't make sense. So for me, it's the uh, interpretability, explainability is a fundamental a uh, concept, fundamental step to understand the model, so that we come up with model that makes sense. So, so uh, this area of interpretability and explainability, I'm um, just uh, instead of uh, continuing to uh, uh, refer to them using these two words, I'll just start using the term transparency. Talk about sure. introducing a new term. Uh, so, in this area of transparency, it seems like. Uh, this is an area where uh, there's at least several libraries, maybe, and several 
uh, or, or at least a few years of people thinking about this uh, this tooling. Of course, uh, obviously, we're entering a world where with bigger and bigger models and more uh, opaque models. But it seems like this is an area, Patrick, where uh, at least uh, uh, they're starting starter libraries and starter toolkits, correct? And all right, so so I want to be sure to give you know, a goose is, is due here. So the PyML library, if people haven't checked that out, go and check it out. Um, it, it's much more than a starter library. It, it has high code and low code functionality. Um, it has very cutting edge, you know, brand new explainable or interpretable models. Um, plus, you know, really, really strong explainability, debugging and validation and, and bias testing now as well. Um, I'd also add, you know, another project that seems fairly mature is Microsoft Research's Interpret. And, um, and so I found, you know, in, in writing the book, oftentimes sending people to PyML, oftentimes sending people to Microsoft's Interpret library. And so for me, I, I'd say those are more than starter libraries. Um, but, you know, every, everything needs more time to mature. Uh, and, and, uh, and Patrick, uh, yep. uh, for people who use uh, commercial products or at least uh, enterprise software uh, products, uh, those software might already start providing uh, some of these capabilities, right? So H2O, Databricks. Yeah, yeah, uh, H2O, SaaS. I... SaaS. Yes, uh, yes. By the way, uh, this kind of is a... Uh, a uh, circular question, but you know, you you have one of these products. They're providing you uh, tools for transparency, but how do you know? How do you know how the transparency tools work? <laughs> well, you got to read a goose's papers. You got a, a goose wrote a great paper called uh, you know designing inherently interpretable machine learning models. So so no, 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 but I mean uh, now you have you're in a position where you have to trust that they're uh, providing <laughs> you the right. Uh, interpretations and explanations, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I, yeah, I mean, we could spend, we'd love to talk about this. Yeah. I think a very powerful capability in PyML and in Interpret is you can compare the sort of ground truth of the interpretable model or the explainable model versus the post hoc explanations, and they do not always match up. And so, so I mean, and and I, you know, I want Auguste to chime in here. If If people are using... SHAP and Lime and these things um, on a model that's not explainable, then they should not necessarily be trusting the results. Um, you can see a wide difference between the, the explanations that some tool presents, whether it's commercial or open source, and then how the model that it's supposedly summarizing actually works. So, so in the book, we say very clearly, like, look, you should be using explainable models and post hoc explanations. Um, not post hoc explanation on unexplainable models. So is the uh, so as as ML and AI get more widely used, the goal is to develop tools that even non data scientists and yeah. experts not necessarily they'll use, but they can at least look at the, what the explanations and interpretations and and, right. and kind of uh, uh, express whether or not they they are comfortable, right? So I think this is one of the things that are important, like the, uh, when we look at model and model can create harm and what kind of application of model, if the application and the damage and the use of model is not very, very critical, then you people may end up with using a black box model and using explainer that doesn't have to be exact. If it's wrong a little bit or sometimes it's wrong, it might be okay. But what Patrick is writing in the book, emphasizing is uh, machine learning for high-risk application, where the consequence is really, really critical. In that situation, do we want to compromise or willing to sacrifice in terms of some of the unknown and uncertainty on the explanation? So in the, uh, in the financial world as well, if we're dealing with model that's really, really important, very, very critical, for example, making decision whether we're going to grant loan or not granting loan to people, that is a very, very high-risk application. Then 
as people, we need to think we need to think about this very, very seriously. Do we want to use black box model and apply explainer? That's available in commercial tool today and a lot of open source. In, in that situation, I would argue that one should really look at inherently interpretable machine learning because you can do it. You design it carefully, you apply a certain constraint with a certain interaction or monotonicity and all kinds of constraints that we can write, that we can put, then we design model, machine learning, still sophisticated, still gradient boosting machine, still neural network, yet inherently interpretable. So we're not compromising in terms of interpretability. We know exactly what the model does. So I think that's the key for high-risk application that people need to think about the design. The design. So, so and I know Ben is talking about like what happens even, you know, how do these explanatory values that we're talking about, line, shaft, model coefficients, whatever, how do those get up-leveled to non-technical users? Um, Agus and I aren't experts on that, and you need people who are experts on it if you're going to be serious about it. But what I do know is if you don't design for explainability from the beginning, then you won't be successful in what you're asking about, Ben. You, you can't simply shoehorn, you know, fancy expert UI, human AI teaming stuff onto a black box model and hope it works. It, it's not going to work. So now uh, I agree, except uh, I think there's limits to what's possible, right? So mm -hmm. at least, uh, uh, especially when we get to the really uh, complex, large models. It, that, it, you, uh, your stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so next topic, uh, debugging machine learning systems for safety and performance. Um, so let me ask you this from uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, developers rather than uh, machine learning. So when you look at software development, they have certain, you know, at this point, best practices, tools, approaches. So are there particular lessons there that map over to ML? Uh, yeah, the, I, uh, I know, no, no. Uh, <laughs> a goose is the world master at, at model validation and model debugging. So I'm going to let him in. I know, I, I know <laughs> machine learning, uh, uh, machine learning applications, while they're not new, they're newer and they're growing. But on the other hand, software has well uh, established processes at this point, right? So. Uh, you can go all the way back from requirements gathering right. and so on and so forth. And then you go to testing, you've got unit testing, integration testing, functional testing, all of these things, right? So yeah. uh, so what uh, what lessons can be learned from traditional right. software? I think I'll, I'll probably draw a parallel from that. Uh, one thing is you have somewhere and you have some somewhere QA, somewhere testing and all of those things. All of those things need to get need to be done in uh, machine learning as well, because machine learning uh, implemented as a software right, or embedded in software. So all of those things has to be done. Agree. Uh, but then there are a few things that are uniquely machine learning, which can also parallel in so some software be, development. Be, before you move on, I I agree. But then uh, uh, if you just say they have to be done. We also have to acknowledge there's it's more challenging to do it, even these traditional things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because now you're dealing with models and uh, data. Then becoming more challenged. So if you think about it, Patrick mentioned about model validation. So this is we, we in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large part of bank, for example, for every three model developer, we have one model validator that their job is equivalent to, supposedly equivalent to computer security folks, finding vulnerability in the model, how the model will be wrong and try to hack the model, right? So so because all model will be wrong, how wrong can it be in what situation will be oh, so wrong? So you, ha you have this now, you have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in banking, okay? Yeah. So I think what Patrick is trying to uh, teach in this uh, book is really, okay, now outside banking, you have to do it too. We are banking, we do it in the last 10 years and we evolve the practice. Now, a few things that we need to talk about. So wait, 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 uh, okay. so to, just to clarify, in banking broadly, not just uh, from uh, people that you know. Yeah, So this is a requirement in SR 11.7 bank. Okay. Every bank need to have independent model validator, separate group 
report to different people that the job is really to uh, find vulnerability in the market, right? So, so that's in banking. The practice that need to be uh, adopted by other industry as well, particularly area that's a high risk application like in healthcare and all of those things, right? So now when we look at this, uh, we, we need to look at what I call it probably four area and model. Ben. One is reliability, that I, a machine will make decision. How reliable is that decision? How confident are you with that decision? So it's like a confidence interval. How confident, how uncertain is the decision? Need to be tested because region or decision that's a wide uncertainty model will be wrong. So that's, we need to understand that. Secondly, is what we talk about model robustness. And this is a lot of machine learning uh, or AI system fail because with very small perturbation noise on the input, the model fail. And, and that is really uniquely machine learning because overly parameterized model will be less robust. So robustness testing need to be done. How the model how the decision will change with small perturbation, small noise corruption on the input. And the third thing that uh, uh, we, uh, we talk about is model resilience, meaning that when world change, the world change, the data shift, the data drift, is the model overly sensitive? Is the model going to still perform well? A good model need to be very, very resilient. For example, in the, in, 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 in banking world, for example, when we originate loan, we keep the loan. When the economy change, environment change, the decision is you start with that decision, right? So the model need to be resilient. So how you test it? That your model resilience under distribution shift. And of course, the fourth thing that's very important is also this decision impact, it can create fairness issue. Is the decision fair? So all of those four components at the very, very minimum has to be tested beyond just performance. So today, machine learning world, the culture in machine learning and the school that teach is only teaching about performance. They don't teach about reliability. They don't teach about robustness. They don't teach about resilience. They don't teach about fairness. This is what the uh, the book that the uh, Patrick is doing is uh, talking about the subject and the, the tool that we built like PyML is exactly addressing all of those. So uh, just really quickly, yeah. I, the one thing I throw in uh, in addition, so we've talked about basic software testing, yes. Reliability, robustness, resilience, bias, yes. If possible, I think people need to do chaos testing as well. Random attacks, chaos testing, very adversarial stress testing. But, but you know, people have to have the time and the resources to do these things, as you pointed out, Ben. Right, 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 right. So I guess even uh, a step further, red teaming, bug bounties, Right, so I, yes, thing. I'm a huge, you know, I was involved in that first Twitter um, bug bounty. I think more companies should be doing that. Socio-technical approaches, socio-technical approaches. By the way, uh, uh, whenever someone starts talking about safety and reliability and robustness, the example immediately that comes to mind is aviation. You know, because basically uh, in aviation, right? So you have... You, if you have a new plane, you have to have undergo mm -hmm. hours and hours of test flights. And and by the way, uh, uh, a goose uh, came from Ford. Ben, I used to manage, I used to design engine. Ben. So before I went to banking, I used to be one of the uh, engine uh, design manager for yeah, yeah. the company. So the thinking, the concept of the robustness and reliability is deep. You know, it's quite right. very applicable as well for 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 more. Right, 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 right. So anyway, so then uh, uh, in, in uh, aviation, right? So you have uh, loss of physics and control theory, and you're not just going to throw all of those out and, and rely completely on machine learning, right? So sometimes domain knowledge uh, mm. uh, is something that uh, people underestimate how important it is. Although now nowadays, it seems like uh, people are... Uh, uh, Acknowledging that. Yeah, that, yeah. Reinforcement that, that, learning with human feedback seems to have really changed the game in language models. And or, I, I would say or even just a hybrid neural neural information retrieval knowledge graph kind of systems, right? So that 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 plug the, into 
Well, plug the the National that. Academies is putting their money in human AI teaming, and the Air Force is putting their money in human AI teaming, you know, as far as from public things that I've read. And so I think um, there's a lot of smart money going into human AI teaming, not necessarily AI based decision making. And, and, and this is the important thing, it's like the, 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 the wonderful world of auto ML. It should not be the end. Auto ML is just a starting point. After you do all the value of starting point, you have candidate model, candidate model. Now the work starts. So now let's design it. Okay, design all this reliability, robustness, et cetera. So I think the uh, a lot of the mistake that people do is the, uh, uh, I do all the ML, I get the best model, I'm done. No, you're not. You just start it. So, so in this area, Patrick, of uh, testing, uh, and robustness. Uh, so we talked about interpretability and explainability and their availability of tools seems to be good. So mm -hmm. in this area of uh, testing and robustness, what's the state of uh, tooling? Definitely, again, you know, PyML is, is what I go to when I need sort of information and inspiration on testing for structured data, okay? So um, I think Agus is, is really one of the world's leading experts on model validation, and he's put a lot of his goodies into PyML. So people should go check that out. On the deep learning side, there's all kinds of interesting things. So I would point out, um, you know, Clever Hans and uh, Robustness out of the Dree Lab at MIT. Um, and then I'm a big fan, and, and Ben, I think you know more about this than I do, but on the um, sort of text model debugging side, I'm a big fan of um, Allen NLP, the Allen Institute uh, NLP. Uh, they, they have a, you know, a kind of a sub-module for different attacks and, and different explainability and debugging functionality. So that's, that's, that's kind of my go-to on the text side. Um, and then, you know, it is harder. I think, you know, a lot of the book focuses on structured data, but there, there are two chapters about images and we've, we've sprinkled in all kinds of stuff about language models because of course that's what people care about right now. And they are very impressive. Uh, and, and so what I find myself doing a lot of times is like looking at the very advanced validation work that, that a goose and people like a goose have done and thinking about like, how can I port this to images? How can I port this to language? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes there's a lot, uh, lot of library out there, particularly on the adversarial. Yeah, right? on adversarial. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very, yeah, yeah. very important. Yeah, because yeah, let's yeah. say language model, the great language model, what's AI we're going to do? Most of the application that we do is for classification, let's say sentiment analysis, uh, or to do detection. For us, it's detecting a, uh, some uh, behavior or things. So how to look at how this model is going to be circumvent? How this model is going to be poor? How this model will be wrong? So, so adversarial testing is really, really important. So, so that is I I, I lump those together as a uh, with robustness because a lot of adversarial testing are really doing a small perturbation and how wrong the uh, uh, the decision will be by by by, by this model. So it's uh, it's a growing area in this and a lot of things even some very huge in the stuff. last few months yeah. huge in the last few months very very basic stuff let's say double negation is the model going to be able to handle double negation or in all of those things right so some basic stuff and some more exoteric stuff that people can do on the uh, adversarial things including uh, and uh and, and and there's all sorts of people who are seem a little more focused on this now so for example the Percy and his group at Stanford with Helm, and uh, that's the holistic evaluation of language models. I mean, yeah, and, yeah, and and I I spent all last week with my head buried in you know anthropic papers and uh, right. the GPT four technical report and system card. Um, I don't like that those are black box audits. I don't think that should be held up as the standard for so called AI safety, but. Uh, nonetheless, those are very valuable resources with very interesting and, and likely important technical approaches for, for debugging these systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there, uh, the, a lot of these themes are investing a little more, a, a lot more in alignment, although yes. you know, of, obviously there's a tension between uh, 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 doing that and, 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 uh, and releasing software, which never as fast as possible. Yes. Which never, which never will go away, especially now yes. as, as things, as things heat up 
And um, I think Can we pause that, uh, on that point for one second? Yeah. Because I think if people are going to read the book and I want people, we want people to read the book, of course, they should really think of the book as a buffet, right? Not most, most AI risk management doesn't work the way a goose gets to work with, with sort of regulations behind him and, and all these resources to get, you know, one tester for every three developers. And, and, and the testers are very skilled and high salaried and completely independent. That's not the reality for most people. So I think for most people reading the book, you know, they, they have to be aware that there's serious pressure from the business and they're not going to be able to fully do everything in the book. And so they need to think of the book as kind of a buffet of interesting risk mitigation approaches and pick what they think is going to work at their organization, given their organization's business pressures. I mean, that, that's just the reality of risk management today outside of banking and a few other highly regulated verticals. So I think it's a really good point. I think it's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I think there's also, uh, uh, I guess, increasing awareness that uh, if you do it early on, you're right. So if you kind of adopt kind of a much more risk management uh, uh, by design mindset early on, then uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of benefits to mm -hmm. that. By the way, uh, 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 one of the things that uh, obviously comes up a lot with models when they break uh, is uh, almost always uh, it comes down to some pipeline that's broken, right? Or data. So, yeah. Like, so, and I guess so for, data counts as the pipeline, yeah. Yeah, yeah, enough. So for data. So at, at the end of the day, uh, a, a lot of the things that we're talking about map also to the data engineering side of things because yes. basically those also need to be uh, uh, subjected to more uh, software engineering rigor because uh, yes, yeah. they ultimately uh, are the reason why a lot of these things break. I would throw in, okay, because because you know I've been working with a lot of social scientists at NIST. I agree. I think a lot of breakages in ML systems come from pipeline issues. Um, you know, API mismatches on the front end, and then the data stuff on the back end. Um, but there's also the, the socio-technical stuff is real, right? I, I was trained as a technician. I'm a coder, and I've been really swayed by, you know, the, the social scientists I've been working with at NIST. And a lot of errors arise from misalignment, like we were just talking about, off-label use, um, not thinking through sort of obvious consequences of deployment, feedback loops in society. So, so I don't want to, you know, errors in models are, are more about code and more are about more than code and data. For sure, but but if we want to stick with the code and data on this podcast, that's fine. And uh, and no, I would just say, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I I think a lot of it also has to do with data, right? So it's basically yeah. You so know, so data, uh, data is very foundational, right? It's that you have to start with data because all these machines are really uh, about modeling data. So data is very fundamental. But I think for me, because even if you got everything right. Your model will make mistake. That's why the model, you have false positive and false negative, right? So you measure it with AUC, you measure it with E squared error, because your model will make mistake. They are all the, uh, now, the problem is, the important things, uh, this is the lesson learned from engineering as well, in the engineering design. The mistake will happen not at the average, not when everything normal and like everything will happen today. But the mistake will happen at the fringe. We need to know in, in engineering, we do tail testing. We test it at the tail, how this model will be wrong. So understanding what, what are the weak region. This is what the debugging that, weak spots. that, that Patrick talked about. The weak spot. Where is the weak spot? Why is this weak spot is so important? Because the world change shifted. If you shift to that region, you expect your model will be more wrong. You should not be surprised. Well, and there's a perfect analog in, in like what we've seen go wrong with language models. Um, a lot of, so, so models have weak spots and where they, where they perform illogic, where they make silly mistakes. And it's typically because we're, we're either out on the tails or just for whatever reason, we're operating in a sparse part of the training data. Right. And, um, I suspect like like the New York Times article where the New York Times article was able to push chat GPT into saying all the weird, you know, have a fair with me type stuff. What I my theory on what happened there is the reporter sort of put, kept pushing the system into a part of its training data where it was more thin. And I suspect that that really, you know, when chat GPT was responding, you know, talking about having affairs and you love me and things like this. 
I suspect it was drawing from just a hand few, a handful of, of, of sort of writings that it had in its training data. And that's why the behavior was so weird. The, the report, you know, my theory on that was the reporter pushed it into a sparse part of its training data and it started behaving weird. But I, I think the important piece of this is really on the risk management side is to be able to understand this. Because using model, we know we're taking concept file, we, we know that we are taking risk when we use using model. But these are very, very useful tool, very useful model. But we know they need to, and they will have weakness that they will be wrong. So the, the job is really understanding this very, very upfront. So when we have problem down the road in the uh, application, it should not be surprised. We know it upfront because we debug it, we test it upfront. No, and I think, the last uh, thing, yeah, well, yeah, very quickly, yeah. very practical advice. If you're training a model and you're testing it, it is not okay just to look at average mean squared error <laughs> or AUC. You have to divide the data set up into segments and look at your performance across segments. If you don't take anything else out of this podcast, check your model for weak spots in performance across segments. Thank I you. think this is very important. Yeah, no, it's really important. This is a complex machinery. And we measure it with average overall, AUC, MSE. Those are average measure. Those are not when the model will fail. Yeah. And I think that's the uh, such complicated machinery we boil down into single or two number. I yeah. think that's dangerous. Silly, that's why yeah. it's very silly. You have to really, this is the value of model debugging, looking at the weak spot. No, I think uh, uh, to, to a large extent, I think a lot of ML teams are aware of a lot of these things, but uh, uh, it all comes. Down I do too. To, I do too. I do too. I think it all comes down to uh, uh, time and resources. Time and resource, and also just their perception of uh, uh, you know, it's the consequence, right? So, so for example, if I ship this and it's not going to cause a financial meltdown, you know, it <laughs> might recommend the wrong product or or do something. Uh, that has uh, that's not as consequential then they tend to ship but now i think with these uh, language models people are now kind of they realize while the utility is high uh, there's also severe consequences you know because it might hallucinate something completely harmful right so so i think uh, the awareness is there uh, now now the now the uh, the culture and the methodologies and the toolings are need to catch up to the mm -hmm. model building and maybe even uh, incorporate uh, a lot of these things into the model building. Because I, for one, think that because uh, a lot of the things that you need to do uh, around alignment actually, uh, I mean, starts at model building. So. So mm -hmm. a lot of these, uh, a lot of this philosophy and uh, the mindset that we're talking about here, uh, you can't just simply farm that out to uh, I'm going to have a red team or I'm going to do no no I'm, and I'm going to maybe... do bug bounties right because uh, especially exactly now right. with these uh, language models they are uh, uh, yeah the a lot of the alignment work that you need to do really starts right there at the beginning yeah. when you're oh, yeah. when at you're the beginning doing, yes. Yeah. When you're designing um, the reward function. Right. Experimental design and the scientific method, right? So, I think it's very, for me, it's simple, but it, but Ben is right that it's not easy to do that in a large organization. So and, I, and I, also, I, I also, and also, this, uh, also, I say in, uh, it needs to be quality by design, not yeah. quality by testing or inspection. Yeah, yeah, and also in uh, traditional software, you don't necessarily have to, uh, Think, think things through to this level of detail because you can always have a you you'll tell yourself I have a security and QA team they'll catch these things but uh, the reality is uh, with this complex models uh, you'll have to do a, a lot of the work yourself yeah. on, the, on the building and development side because uh, you can't just expect your bounty team and your red team to catch a lot of these things. Well, and, and in my experience, sort of trying to bring this to bear inside large organizations, um, and I think this is changing. I, I do think this is changing, but say two years ago when we were talking to incident responders at companies that, you know, in my opinion, really know what they're doing when it comes to cybersecurity, it was really hard to even have the incident responders think of a failure of an AI system as an incident. And I think that is changing, you know, but but there needs to be, so 
There's the AI incident database that I would, you know, if you're listening, uh, Google AI incident database, I think it's really worth scrolling through um, to get an idea of what happens when these systems fail. And, and they really can be instant. And, and just the one that I always go back to is um, a robot in an Amazon factory punctured a case of bear mace and sent, you know, 40 some people, something like that to the hospital. And that's an incident that needs to be responded to, right? There, there needs to be a team that knows how to respond to that because um, it's serious. And I think, you know, there is a sl- the cyber side of all this is really interesting. And, and oh maybe yeah, yeah. Can, so yeah, yeah, I was gonna, yeah, I was yeah. We gonna, can jump there. We can jump there. Yeah. I was going to ask so organizationally, how is this playing out? Are people farming this out to their cyber team? So I, that- I so so okay. So a goose operates in this in this more structured scenario where he has a, a very serious and well-resourced model validation team. And then also, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, he has a cyber team, he has a data privacy team, he has a fair lending team. Um, but in a regular organization, that's not a bank, you're not going to have all that. And so I see what I see most commonly at big tech companies is new AI red teaming functions that, that maybe have dedicated personnel or maybe borrow personnel, some from cyber, some from responsible AI. Um, and so it's much more of an ad hoc effort in a big tech company, say. Uh, but but I do think that that they are starting to realize there is where such a do thing. They, as, where do these people report? Um, typically, uh, so the one I'm working with now, they, they report up through responsible AI. And responsible and security AI. and security and security. And responsible AI is uh, independent of AI. Um, or, or do they report? Well, all right. It depends if you want good <laughs> results or not. If if you want good results, so yeah. yeah I mean, we could talk about this forever. Um, you know, it's very difficult for me to talk about BNH's work. It's highly confidential. Okay. Uh, but but no, I'm just uh, I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat- the Pat- one Patrick that we're deep in on right now. The the responsible AI team mm-hmm. is highly empowered and very high up in the C suite. Okay, no, no, and but, that's uh, how you get good results. Uh, forget about the people you're working. Yeah, that, this client now, but just typical scenario. The All t- right. Well, unfortunately, the typical scenario is there is no red teaming and the and there's a director of responsible AI with no budget and no staff that reports somehow up to the CTO and gets everything they're working on canceled. I, I would say and, that, and, that's and, the typical and, scenario. And the, and the cyber folks are completely disengaged from this topic? Typically. Not completely disengaged, but but I would say at arm's length. At, at or arm's low length. Per, low priority for them because they have other things they need to deliver. Yeah, yeah, because ransomware and and phishing and is all higher priority. So this this topic is somewhat of an orphan organizationally. Without the kind of structures that the SR eleven seven guidance puts in place, it will be an orphan organizationally, and you will not get good risk management results, and and that's really painful for organizations to internalize. So let so me ask you this, uh, I guess. I guess. I guess. Let me uh, let me ask you this question for our listeners who are mostly from the tech sector. Yeah, yeah. So so obviously you you folks do it well, but. Uh, uh, we just heard about Silicon Valley Bank not having a risk management officer for over nine months. So obviously, this is not uh, 100% how things are done in financial services either, right? Yes. So, so, but uh, assuming you do it well, so describe completely your structure, who who reports to who, so that people might be inspired by how you mm-hmm. folks do things. Yeah, so I'll give an example because this is the, the very in, in in banking very clearly stated in SR eleven seven the uh, the, uh, the stature of the uh, model risk management right so well very clear uh, on, uh, definition and role and responsibility of what we call it as the front line which is model developer and model owner they have to test they have to do all of those things in part of the development. And model risk management, which is in risk management, structure-wise, model risk management is risk management. Every every large bank have somebody like me as the uh, head of model risk, and the person like me report directly to chief risk officer. And chief risk officer uh, administratively report to CEO, but the the uh, chief risk officer report to the board directly through board risk committee. 
And what so, is the relationship between this group of people and the people who build the models? People who build the models in the business, right? They don't, people, they report to the, uh, uh, if it's a technology model, report to the CPO. If it's a uh, uh, consumer bank, report to the consumer, C, consumer bank CEO. So very, very separate. So, but independent. That, and independent. The, key, the key, the key is, and this is hard for tech companies, and and it, it may take regulation to change it. But I do think if you're serious about having the best possible result from your modeling, then you have to take what what we're saying seriously. If your testers aren't independent, you know, having a completely different reporting chain, and also having equal stature, equal titles, equal pay. Um, then you're just not going to get good validation results and your models aren't going to be as good. And, and I think it is really hard for tech companies to set this up because it, it slows things down. Um, but, but if you want to be serious about machine learning, it's, it's kind of something you have to swallow. I, I give you an example in, in my case, right? So yeah. I'm the most senior uh, person in the, in the bank. All the head of model development, which we are starting to have several of them supporting the data company, they are at the same level on my direct report, which is the head of model validation, right? So the model development report to the business, they are at the same level seniority as my head of model validation report. So if you want to be serious, you need to put that stature, that very high level on the risk management side that it will be able to say yes or no. So the team in the in MRM will be here. It's the final decision maker whether this model is going to be put in production or not. So the add on model validation can stop. This will not go to production. So, so I think uh, the difference here, Patrick, is that... Uh, There's a big difference. So I, I think, I think uh, without the, without the uh, forcing function of regulation, I think this... Uh, I think uh, aspirationally, people can have an independent group that's fine. I think most people have no problem with that. But uh, whether or not that independent group will have the same status or power, I think that's a uh, that would be uh, mm. so. Uh, what it would be it, hard to imagine that that would become the norm unless there's some forcing function. I which, agree. It, which, by the way, there is there a may be function in finance, right? So yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So of got, course. So of so course. without that forcing function, who knows what the situation. Yeah. Think, yes. Yeah. <laughs> things things would be different. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it's, it's worth it. Like we need to talk about realistic risk management. And so again, I know that, that for people working in tech companies who read the book, they're not going to be able to do everything. And again, you know, if you try to do everything as an individual practitioner, you're going to be really frustrated because you don't have all this organizational support that, that a goose is talking about, you know, one cranky developer or data scientist in the room can only do so much. So I think, um, you know, when reading the book, think about it as a tool to build better models. And then you want to think of the risk management stuff as kind of a, a smorgasbord or a buffet and, and pick what's going to work in your organization. I think that's very important, Ben. Yeah, to make to make this one a sensible uh, from the business point of view, yeah, becoming more natural discipline for people who build model. And know? is there a way to uh, so so absent the absent uh, um, legislation or or even executive buy-in? There might be a way for you if you if you take inspiration from uh, what's in the book to slowly kind of evangelize and slowly change the culture inside your company from the bottom up. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's a big ask, but I think if you can prove to the rest of the team that uh, these things are uh, very high impact. Uh, for better models. For better models, that, right? So maybe that's another way that uh, this book might be useful uh, yeah. as a way to kind of... Uh, socialize and evangelize from the ground up. Oh, I, and, and I think that's totally true. I mean, I like to think I'm a, I'm a good modeler. Uh, and, and so I would say, you know, from that perspective, the points I would really hit on, and I brought this up before in the podcast but, and all of the time, um, experimental design. Agus has a great book on experimental design for computer experiments. 
um, experimental design and the scientific method. And if you're telling me that you can build better models without experimental design and the scientific method than you can with them, then, you know, there's something really weird with what you're doing with models. And so I think, you know, that in, in terms of better modeling, the book just hits on think of machine learning as a, as a more traditional science um, and, and try to design careful experiments that show your model works in the real world. And so I think that, you know, those are the points I'd highlight from, from building better models. And then all the techniques and packages just kind of fall from there. Well, oh, you forgot the uh, main advice of BNH, Andrew, which is uh, pay attention to documentation. Oh, sorry. I didn't, we, we have another one. We have another. I didn't know what you were going for. Um, we, we say uh, computers are hard and, you know, technology is hard and computers are not to be trusted. That's, that's another one of our little sayings. I didn't know if you were going to say that. But yeah, yeah. Read the documentation. So read the book. Read the documentation, please. So closing thoughts, Goose, for our listeners who are not in financial services. So... Any, any parting advice for how they can uh, uh, implement some of these ideas? Yeah, I think it's really like what we talk about this, right? Really uh, think up from the design and quality. So not just solely focus on one dimensional on the performance, but thinking about what can go wrong. And let's understand that. Let's do uh, Let's uh, try to uh, try to try to understand those and and and, and manage it. So I think if people uh, can do just uh, uh, this common sense, uh, looking at models as beyond simple performance, but really think about uh, what we're doing. And with that, uh, thank you both, and I will place a link, hopefully, to the book if it's out. If not, uh, I'll at least put the title in the episode notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.